Okay, so my name is Brandon Weaver, and as was mentioned, I currently work over at Square on a lot of Ruby teaching, and one day I kind of had the crazy idea, well, how about we try and teach with Cartoon Leavers, have a little bit more fun, try something a bit more chaotic, kind of in the spirit of some of the early days of Ruby, of Why Lucky Stiff and other people like that. Now, with that said, let's go ahead and get started into what exactly goes behind a lot of these type of talks and what it takes to make a fully illustrated conference talk. Okay. So what we're going to start off with are the adventures of Red Lemur, which is the main character of a lot of these talks. So Red is Lemur, and he's gone on quite a few adventures over the years in programming and had quite a few stories to tell. It all started with Reducing Innumerable, a tale of a student, Red, who's first introduced here as he journeyed through lands of Innumerable, which is kind of collection libraries like Map, Reduce, Filter, Select, if you're familiar with other languages and how those are implemented with Reduce from several wise masters. And then we went on to a story of operations and capacity planning during the holiday season with Scaling Christmas. Oh right, there was one time that I ended up showing up to a programming conference in a full tuxedo and a Beethoven looking wig to conduct a symphony orchestra, which had been a lifetime dream of mine. Not exactly the way I saw it going down because I conducted it over the entire audience's cell phones using web sockets. It, it mostly worked. It mostly worked. Anyways, <laughs> we did get some fun looks and a lot of people were asking me, are you sure you're in the right place? Oh, yeah, I am. You, you'll see. You'll see. And then we went on from there to take an adventure into the depths of the really dark magics of the Ruby programming language with Dark Lord Crimson in Tales of the Ruby Grimoire. Which, again, put us back right about Christmas time this last year in The Night Before Code Freeze, where I ended up taking The Night Before Christmas and gave it a fun new twist about the days before Code Freeze, some of the outages, and other operations details. So, all this to say, our little friend here, Red, has gone on quite a few adventures over the years, and I hope, at least for his sake, he's learned quite a bit in the process. And now it's about time for him to go on to a new adventure. An adventure through all of time and space with a mysterious figure known as the Professor. Now, some of you might get where I'm going, and I'll get back to that in a little bit. And it will indeed be a grand adventure, but we're here today to take a look behind lemurs, behind what goes into making an illustrated conference talk. So, how would you like to take a look at lemurs? Because I'm quite sure they'd like to take a look as well. Progress of the lemurs. So Red himself has had quite a long journey to get to where he is now. I mean, originally he was actually blue of all things and known as the dark magic lemur. And a lot of times it was kind of my warning sign of one of those things. You've seen a lot of books, the little big exclamation point saying, don't do this, don't do this, this is bad, this is a warning sign. It was kind of my indication of this is dangerous, but I'm gonna show you anyways because it's fun and because I'm that type of person. So. This eventually ended up evolving into various libraries, frameworks, and other things like this, and Red evolved from there as we're going along and eventually ended up going into the digital realm right about two or three years ago. And really though, all the lemurs have evolved quite a bit since they originally came into being, and I've been drawing Red for, I would say, about four years now, and the rest of the lemurs not too long afterwards. Why the rest of them? Well, I figure if I have a lemur named Red, I should probably have one for the other colors as well. And by this point, there are several more that you don't even see on the screen here. And you can see how they actually started and how much I've kind of improved since then and how much I'll probably improve in the next few years as well. So you gotta start somewhere on this. And I did start somewhere a long time ago. I've been drawing for several years now. I think the earliest one here up in the top left corner was sometime around 12 or 13. As you can tell, I kind of went through a Dragon Ball Z and anime phase like most young men of my age. And... Eventually, I started trying realism, a few other styles, and I still have a number of years ahead of me, a lot more practice, but looking back to where I was, I know I've made progress, and that's a really valuable thing to see, and why I'd encourage, especially to save some of your art from the old days, to see, yeah, I may not be the best ever, but hey, I'm getting better, and that's all that matters. Now, sure, I've done a lot of traditional art, but one style in particular has always captured my imagination, that was celestial or space art. Now, I started playing with this sometime around 12 years ago when my father managed to 
he was a photographer, so he had a copy of Photoshop. So I got a hold of this and figured out, wait a second, I can do photo manipulation. I can make space. I can make my own creative imagination type lands here. And eventually it ended up turning into all this art you see here among several other pieces. And I have been doing this for a number of years and it's been kind of sad for me. So I decided, you know, let's try and get back into that. Give it another try. And then with the lemur talks, I decided, wait a second, how can I take the space art, the lemurs, and some type of programming concept and make them into one thing? Though I get ahead of myself a little bit. Because it all ends up starting with a story. You see, art is great, but what really brings things together is a story, and I really love a good story. A triumph, a victory, a challenge overcome, a lesson learned. A good story can transport us to another world, give us wings to fly, let our imagination soar. It awakens the creativity and possibility in our minds and gives us hope for what could and may well be in the future. And stories have this wondrous power to ground the abstract in reality, to give us a tangible grasp on the ethereal and difficult to comprehend subjects. And for me, every good talk ends up starting with a story, and every picture helps me tell that story. Could be anything really and frequently i have the story well before i actually know when the world i'm going to talk about sometimes i start imagining things maybe a detective noir a musical maybe getting lost while traveling how about a trip to wonderland or even all the space and time itself there's no limit of stories out there to tell and with luck i'll be able to tell several more but this this is the latest story i want to tell and how that came into being now those who know me know I have an affinity and a particular fondness for a certain science fiction show known as Doctor Who. Now, the show follows a figure known as the Doctor as they travel through all of time and space to help those in need, and sometimes get into a little bit of trouble along the way. I mean, that's kind of what you do. And kind of the multiple incarnations of the Doctor as they have reincarnated and changed their form. Now, I myself am partial to the 10th Doctor, but quite like the most recent 13th Doctor, which is who I've decided to base a professor on. So much so, in fact, I can occasionally be convinced to shave my beard, and I might show up at various conventions dressed as said Doctor. And there was that one time that I was fortunate enough to even manage to find the actual Doctor. But that's a story for another day. So how exactly do I take the story of an ancient Time Lord and relate that into programming? Well, it's right there in the title, all of time and space. And in this particular case, RailsConf had a track called Active Support and kind of diving into how the language was modified to make it easier to express dates, times, and other durations like that. So I decided, what if I combined this technical concept with kind of this love for space art with the idea of Doctor Who, and it started kind of percolating in my head over the past few years until I finally had a chance to submit it. Now, Active support around time allows you to do some fun things by extending the core of the language. Like you could say integer like 5 dot years ago or 10 dot seconds ago or 10 seconds since or any number of things. It allows you to say something very expressively, very fluently. Now, one of the prerequisites for tying a technical concept to a story is that it has to have some depth. It has to be able to stand on its own. It has to have substance enough that you can make an entire talk out of it. And time? Time is probably one of the hardest things in programming. Just ask the Y2K crowd or coming up if you really want to have fun, the 2038 crowd. Now, time is a hard thing and expressing, manipulating it can be a really fascinating topic. So great, we have a subject line and a theme, but what about the story? I mean, everything catches fire and nothing can really come together cohesively until you really have that story to tie it all together. So where do I end up going with this? Well, that's where Dear Red comes into play. You see the Doctor, or the Professor in our case, throughout the various series of Doctor Who, has a love for traveling companions, which they, he or she, depending on which incarnation you happen to be talking about, finds a companion, takes them on some magical adventure, and who knows, maybe they help each other. Maybe who knows what happens. And who better than an unsuspecting little student like Red? I mean, just throw a giant transdimensional library card box in the middle of his room, and I'm sure the rest of the story will sort itself out eventually. 
But what if this time Red was one teaching and fixing instead of being taught? What if the Professor Stardust, which is doing active sport rigging of time including space, ran on Ruby and Red's master Scarlet was one who created the original machine? So how do those all tie in together? Well, let's say the control panel that controls its ability to go through all of time and space happened to run on Ruby, and that all the dials and all the mechanisms for controlling that happen to be variations of active support. Now, with Red here, we're going to have him try and reinvent a lot of these components because they're, as in many cases with these stories, conveniently broken for some reason. And maybe this is just another test of his master and the professor happens to be in on it, and just so happen to break things, just make sure Red had to fix them. And with that, away he would probably go on another magical adventure. So we have a story, a theme, and a tech concept. How do we go from those three core pieces to actually getting a full talk? Well, that's what we're going to dig into real quick. So what we start out with is the art process. And as with most talks, I tend to start with an outline and then evolve that into a document where I write out the entire story. And every so often I'll add kind of a pseudo marker like IMG, just to let me know, okay, put an image roughly right about here. And I start writing things out and trying to figure out how's the story gonna flow together? How's everything going to match? And I'll rearrange those images. Now, this only works if I have a very good idea of what exactly I'm trying to do. But most of the time, if I don't, I end up doing something called storyboarding. And in previous talks like this one, which was reducing innumerable, I didn't really know what in the world I was going to do. So I took a deck of index cards and just started writing out a huge amount of these little index cards and rearranging them, kind of mix and matching until eventually it seemed to come together. And I thought, you know, okay, I can kind of see where this is going. It's starting to feel real to me. And then transitioning that into some type of tracker to see where exactly am I at on this. So what I use is a little Google Sheet just to keep track of what exactly I'm doing. And it has some conditional highlighting of whenever I put an X in something, it doesn't have to be an X, it could be any letter, just to see that yes, that's green and kind of give me the fulfillment of yes, I'm actually making progress, yes, I'm actually getting somewhere. I did add that difficulty ranking there to the left of it because I kept on getting way too happy with myself saying, hey, look, most of the sheet's green except all the hard drawings are conveniently not done and I'm still 95% done. So I adjusted that a little bit. The problem is you sometimes get a little bit carried away and you spend more time on the tracking than actually working on the talk. So I don't want to admit to how long it took me to put together all the sheet tracking and everything else like that, but I should probably stop on that. Now, I like to have a plan before I really start to go into everything because otherwise it feels like a lot of duct taping or guessing. And a lot of these tools help me to do that. And once I have a plan, everything really starts to come together. Maybe I should try and find a way to sneak the A-team in sometime. What do you think? L-team? Anyways, I get distracted. Point is, anything could be a trigger for a story, and if you write all those down, eventually one of them is going to come in handy sometime. So once I get that done, it's time to go to the sketchbooks. And I still really enjoy paper, as I'm a primarily traditional artist. And I probably have a few of these sketchbooks sitting behind me somewhere, but I'm not going to try and find where exactly they're at. I mean, I'm getting more comfortable with digital, but that really takes time. And I'll get back to that in a moment. Honestly, it's just mostly because I'm more fond of paper and I can get a little bit finer detail and be able to draw a little bit more stably on that. Now, typically when I'm drawing, I tend to use a series of blue pencils. And you'll notice a lot of my drawings tend to be in blue lead. You might wonder, why that? Why not just traditional lead? Well, one of the tricks is that they don't smudge nearly as easily. So if I'm getting carried away, I don't have a conveniently crumbed up hand for probably the next week or so until I end up getting all that off. And it tends to be a lot easier to trace over later. I mean, with some pens, because it's wax based, it doesn't exactly go cleanly, but for things like scanning and or otherwise, it's actually very useful. Now, as far as pencils there, I'm quite fond of rot rings, which have a little bit of heft and don't feel like I'm going to snap them in half whenever I happen to be drawing with something. But honestly, any pencil will do, as long as it feels good in your hand, that's all that really matters. The tool really doesn't make a difference. I could do this with a cheap five cent pencil or anything, and a lot of it is more about the practice. Now, the lead itself is either a Pentel Blue 0 0.5 or Pilot Eno Color 0 0.7 in teal. And for me, I'm a lot more fond of the 0 0.7, 
but that's mostly because I have an incredibly heavy hand and I break a truly unfortunate amount of lead to where I have to have a lot of backstock just to make sure that I don't run out again. And for really rough, I have no idea what in the world I'm doing and I have no idea what I want to draw. I tend to use one of those non-photo blue pencils as well. So normally though, just the 0.7 kind of freehand things and sketch things in. And on occasion, I do have to erase things. It's thankfully getting more rare, but it's okay to erase things every now and then. I use a Tomboy Mono, which is a little bit of a finer nibbed eraser, just so I can dig into the details. I might actually have that right here. And what those allow you to do is you have a little eraser tip right here, which allows you to get into the nooks and crannies there. Instead of erasing like a whole section, you can just erase that one little bit that's kind of annoying you. And other than that, just a typical plastic eraser. Now, it should be noted that I've accumulated several full sketchbooks of lemurs by this point, and probably several more over the years, not counting random doodling on other mediums on my iPad or anything else. And I can't say it enough. If you want to be good, you have to practice quite a bit on that. You have to let yourself be bad for a while in order to get good on a lot of these type of things. And a lot of it is the journey of progressing in that, which really makes it special, because if you could snap your fingers, be instantly good at anything, you'd never really appreciate it. And a lot of my appreciation for art and all the things I've gotten around that have come from working so hard over so many years to try and get to the point where I am. Now, all that said, I still have a long ways to go, and I'm very cognizant of that. But at the same time, it's nice every now and then to step back and say, you know, maybe I'm doing pretty good. So how exactly do I get that onto my iPad for tracing? Do I have some grand magic to scan and properly import everything? Do I have some really high DPI scanner that I've spent thousands of dollars on? No, no, it's actually kind of boringly simple. What I do is I take my iPad and I take a bunch of photos of everything real quick. I mean, honestly, a lot of things, it doesn't have to be pretty. It doesn't have to be advanced. It just has to work. And in this case, all I have to do is get a gist of what exactly a sketch is in order to work on top of that. And if I can get that done, that's all I really need. So see, with this, it's one of the older sketches, but it's honestly just tracing and kind of overlaying on top of sketch and building things up. Now, this is how I really started with some of the lemur talks a few years ago, and I've learned quite a few more things since working like this. And it turns out that impending deadlines of submitting to conferences with ideas of making a sketch talk where you've never done that before is really great for learning very quickly how to draw digitally. I wouldn't suggest that it's horribly stressful. Or I would suggest it depends on you. Now, you might notice here in this screen, and this is from the Ruby Grimoire, that it looks a little bit odd in comparison. The colors aren't quite as vibrant and there's a grip on the pencil. Well, that's because I'm using a matte screen protector to get the feel of paper and get a little bit of drag. As drawing on straight glass was really difficult whenever I was getting started, it felt like I was sliding around everywhere and I couldn't really get a solid grip on anything. I also use a pencil grip, which I happen to pilfer from some um, really old Stadler technical pen that's no longer manufactured. Apple pencils tend to be a bit slippery, so having that extra little bit of grip on them like this means that my hand, after maybe a couple hours of going at this, will still be able to keep some amount of detail instead of kind of slipping all over the place, and it really helps stabilize things. I mean, these two pieces alone made a massive difference, allowed me to draw substantially faster, have more control, have more accuracy, erase less, and really be able to get things done, and further allowed me to transition to more of an all-digital workflow. So from there, I use a program called Illustrator Draw. And the reason for this is because other Adobe applications can work directly with any of the exported layers over there, including Illustrator, which means these things can be exported into vectors. So I can scale them up or scale them down. Like let's say I scale them down to make a bunch of lemur stickers I can hand around for some scavenger hunt. Or I can blow it up and make a giant lemur. It's really great fun. By the way, I shouldn't be trusted on the internet with credit cards. It's a very dangerous thing. Anyway, not, not the point. So there are a few tricks I use this application to make myself more effective. I start out by tracing every character, maybe making a few corrections, then cloning that outline layer so I can paint behind it. What I do is I typically use a base color and then shade from there. And the reason I do this is because that outlining tends to kind of get all the shading lines going in and intersecting with them. And if I ever disable the outline layer, you can see a whole bunch of kind of messy shading from all the various colors and everything as I'm going around this. The good thing about the outline is no one will really know the difference on that. 
So one of the other fun tricks is line smoothing, which is an option allowed in there. It's great for organic shapes to kind of correct. I mean, if you have a really nasty meandering line, they'll kind of correct it and put it back into flow. And it's great for that. The problem is if you're ever trying to draw something like a star, <laughs> that ends up being a little bit of a pain because none of the lines will, well, all lines will get autocorrected and you'll end up with some really curvy looking star. So I had to draw all those by hand. But other than that, it's actually quite good. So one tip is to work smarter and not necessarily harder on a lot of this stuff. So one thing I do because these take so long and I'll get into how long these end up taking is that I'll create character sheets of various expressions, poses and other things to give some dynamicism without doing a lot more work on custom backgrounds, drawing everything from scratch. So on occasion, you'll notice I reuse resources, poses or other things to make scenes more dynamic without the severe cost of doing every illustration just from the base layer which every illustration takes roughly three or four hours to do. So you can imagine how that would add up very quickly. But if there's one thing that I really value out of this application, it's a time lapse. And let's take a look at how one of those drawings works real quick. So as a point of reference, yes, I can draw purely digitally and do challenge myself on occasion. So I typically start out again with blue lining things and kind of getting an idea of the layout of the characters. And sometimes I'll use characters as reference, move them around so they're in view because I'm scoping in and out as I'm doing this. So they may not be exactly in view. So I kind of firm in what exactly I'm doing here. And then with the dartist in the background there, that was a lot of rulers and measuring and making sure I got everything right. And then kind of your typical rule of thirds, laying out the background, sketching out things, getting an idea of what exactly am I doing? How is this going to work? And then eventually going in and inking everything using the black outlines, which will eventually become the full image. I mean, the base layer doesn't have to be nice, it just has to work. So from there, I'll start filling in all the colors and then eventually start working on the background. I start with darks and kind of move up lights and I will add layers to this as I go. I tend to use a lot of spirals as well, just because they're very common shapes and very easy to do, as well as some blending modes as far as lighting. And then I'll go in and I'll shade right behind all those outlines. You'll notice I have the arrow there. It's because I'm scoping in and out. I can't really see where the light source is coming from. So I like to remind myself every now and then. The unfortunate part about stars like that though, is I have to literally sit there and dot the iPad for about a good three or four minutes to really get that done. And then eventually I'll start kind of rearranging everything until it feels right, like make the police box or the professor call box a little bit smaller. And with the lettering, I'm still not exceptionally good at that. I'm probably gonna have to practice that for a while, but you get the point. It allows you to kind of go back and see it. Also, I promise I don't draw nearly that quickly. That's very much sped up. That took me several hours to do. But it's nice just to be able to see and show other people what went into this in a very brief amount of time. So how do we bring this all together? After a while, we have all our art ready. We're mostly ready to go and it's time to put it together. Using the export feature of Illustrator, I start to export all these images and name them things to put in the presentation like 00 title or 0101 conversation for various stages of a certain image where I change character pose or what they were saying or what they were doing or something like that to let me know where the illustration is meant to go and how exactly it's gonna fall into the order here. Now the fun part is getting the other code samples. And a lot of people tend to ask me, how do you do a syntax highlight? What's the magical cheat? Because you have several ones, don't you? This is unfortunately one of the cases where I do not have cheats. And I do a lot of this by hand. It's more of a concept highlighting rather than syntax highlighting where the color is bound towards context and what exactly is flowing through. And Keynote allows me to do this thing called magic move, which allows me to highlight code as concepts rather than syntax. Now when code is to be discussed, I blur it to light gray to bring attention to other parts. So let's take an example from the last talk that I did. In this one, you can see that I've blurred out the return and the actual return value of this move north function in JavaScript. Now I can use the color to highlight what exactly we're focusing on, the red for the variables, the blue for the values, and I can show what exactly those values are whenever they get into that function. And then I can jump back using magic move to show what's changed and then take a brand new view at it. And I can say the Y is now different because it's purple, for instance. And I can even show simplifications like JavaScript punning where you see the code evolve step by step. Now, one of the tricks though that you can get away with is only about two or three concepts before things really start to get over encumbered and it's very hard to follow. And you have to be really careful about that because there's a lot of stuff you could potentially explain, but you have to try and keep it simple 
because otherwise it gets really hard to follow and the audience is more just trying to keep up than they're really appreciating and learning from something. I always really dislike cutting things down, but I think it makes the talks far more accessible and easy to understand. So why the story then? Well, to keep things broken up, to give some brief reprieves, breaks otherwise between heavy technical topics. It allows us to discuss, in some ways reflect, and really dig in before jumping on the next topic. With all this together though, it's time for my personal favorite. And that would be the performance itself. So the best part of a talk is being able to actually perform it. And all the presentation, all the preparation effort, a little bit of extra flamboyance, maybe a red blazer, because why not? We're having fun with things. I mean, that's exactly what you do whenever you're having a presentation, right? As you see, a story isn't the only part of the performance. I've also been known to do random voices or other eccentric props or other things like that, and it really works out well. So a finished lemur talk averages around 40, 50 illustrations, 80 hours of work, hundreds of slides, and a very good deal of whimsy. So it's really special for me to be able to share that with everyone and share that, yes, everything is done, and here's what we got out of it. So when is the professor appearing? Well, very soon. The talk isn't quite done yet, but this one is special to me, and I want to make it special for everyone, and that takes time. And it's been kind of hard for all of us recently, and it's okay to take care of yourself, take breaks, take a step back and say, I really need to make sure this is done right, and take the time to make sure that you get there. And Professor Wynn is very special to me as a combination of all the space art I've done over the years of Doctor Who and just being a particularly fun subject to cover, and I'll be announcing that on Twitter and recording it as well. So, to wrap up on everything, eventually the performance is over, the magic fades, the lemurs are done for the day. And really what makes these talks special to me is hearing everyone's stories of what they saw out of the talk, what they got out of things, what it's inspired them to do, maybe perhaps the crazy ideas they've already had or the ones they've decided to implement. Because programming to me is a community and one that's very dear to me. In the end, we're all stories and experiences, so let's do our best to make them good. So if you want to find out more about who I am or what I'm doing or the further adventure to Lemur, feel free to check me out on any of the following social networks because I do fully intend to make more. But as a reminder, these talks don't happen without several people supporting me, whether it be reading proposals, critiquing ideas, checking code, commenting on illustrations, or even really just being there for me. And I've had lots of help getting these talks done because one of the most important lessons I could ever give to any engineer is that programming is not a solo journey. It's a journey with friends, with allies, people to laugh with, people to cry with, people to learn with, people to exist with. And I'm really proud to have gone on that journey with such great friends. And with that, thank you so much for your time. Now go out, tell your own whimsical stories. I'd love to see a few illustrated talks in the future. Thank you.